Hello, fellow sojourners, fellow travelers, Mike, Tim, and you here today on the Voxology Podcast. So we're delighted that you're uh, tuning in. A again, we're always pleasantly surprised that uh, people other than our direct relatives, even they don't listen. But um, although you you have a couple, you have a couple relatives that listen. I, I, my dad uh, listens from time to time. Yeah, my brother, my brother listens. Uh, but that's it. Uh, I think I've I've joked before. Hannah, my daughter, said, "Hey, I'll listen to them when you're dead, and it'll be great to hear your voice." So there you go. That'll be awesome. So we're just Very storing practical. up. Hannah, if you make it this far, just know <laughs> that I love you. All right, always, always, and forever. She's uh, listening. How are you today? Blade, Blade Runner twenty forty nine era. I'm doing great. How are you? Uh, well, I mean, I wasn't ready for that short of an answer, but um, I'm doing great. Uh, good. Now that we got that out of the way, um, yesterday, we're recording this on a Friday. Yesterday, we had another school shooting uh, in Atlanta. Last I saw, four uh, people were dead, two teachers, two, two students, and what, nine were injured or, or something? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. And I just, I just want to register. I mean, we could do this literally every day. We could just go online and register objections and laments and protests against gun violence in America. Um, but, but, you know, when, whenever, I mean, and, and the kid was 14. Yeah. Um, evidently the shooter was for 14 years old, walking in with a shotgun. It's just unimaginable. And, and we've grown so numb to it. Part of my, I just, part, part of my, part of my, not wanting to grow numb to it. It's just registering that this happened yesterday and how much I hate it. And, um, and I, I don't, I really don't understand how the pro-life community just sits back and calls this normal. Not all of them, obviously, but enough Quite that nothing happens. <clears throat> um, I just don't, I, I, I don't understand the Christian position on guns. I don't understand. It seems totally antithetical to everything we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm fine with, with, um, if you want to hunt great, but that, but this, that this, like, like the, the, there was a video circulating of the, the Congress person who oversees from this that district district. Yeah. From that district, just doing a political ad where he's boasting about his guns and prowess. And I mean, you're just like, what in the world? And then, and then yesterday, and they, this, this is the part that drives me insane. Yesterday, uh, the, the Georgia governor is asked, what can be done to make Georgia schools safer? The governor responds, this is not the day to talk about safety or policy. We need thoughts and prayers for the victims, law enforcement, and educators. And I really, I really want to cuss at that. Um, this is the absolute perfect time. Yeah. To talk about safety and policy. My Lord, it's like they just know if they if they delay it long enough, we'll all focus on something else. I just every school shooting, that's the response. No matter where it is, hey, today's not the time. And it's like, well, when the hell is the freaking time? Yeah. When my son, who has Down syndrome, comes strolling in telling me about a lockdown drill he had at his high school. Mm -hmm. and that he's learning to be quiet. I mean, it's just like, come on, guys, really? That is our response. Yeah, that's our response. That's our response. I don't, I just don't get it. I understand. I understand my parents, uh, my dad, my stepfather, my father-in-law all served in the military. My father was a cop. I, I have served with, uh, as a chaplain for police officers. I understand. But there is an energy and a craziness and an obsessing that's going on around guns that is not, it goes far beyond the need for self-defense or the need for um well, it's weird when congress people wear ar-15 pins it's like it's it's so far what? the other end of the spectrum of celebrating it's a feel i mean i cannot imagine being a parent whose kid died in one of these incidents and seeing those that represent me wearing the oh, pins of Lord. the weapons that do this it's just, yeah. and then yesterday too was also or this year would be the year that the Sandy Hook kids would have graduated from high school. Oh my lord! And it's just like it's a remind. It's a constant reminder of yeah, just the Our most failure. vulnerable of us. That yep. I just yeah I yep yep 
Yeah, we want to regulate. We want to regulate voting, uh, which I'm great. We want to regulate reproductive rights. Fine. Um, gender studies. Okay, but this one, this one's untouchable, baby. Sorry, can't do it. It's just yeah. I, I don't I don't get it. And then so so one of the frustrating responses is, hey, today's not the day for policy, which is such BS. What what cowards are sitting in our political offices? Not all of them, but a lot enough that nothing happens. Right. Um, the other response that is tragic is, hey, this is a God problem, not a gun problem. And I just call BS on that. And BS here means Bible study, um, although I want it to mean. I want it to mean something else. Uh, there's a guy named Samuel Perry, who is a professor uh, who I follow on the uh, the X or the, the Twitter, as I will always refer to it. And uh, he posted some research that is done um, uh, uh, correlating um, the gun deaths are positively correlated with multiple measures of religiosity and religious conservatism in a state. In other words, gun deaths rise with the percentage of a state who attends church weekly, wow. and they fall as the percentage of a state who seldom never attends increases. So, so the more people that attend church, the more, the more gun deaths there are. <clears throat> and the more people who do not attend church in any way, shape, or form leads to fewer deaths. And I'm looking at the graphs of this particular study, and they're they're absolutely striking. There's no question. If you want the research, go to Samuel Perry, Prof Sam Perry, P-E-R-R-Y on Twitter. And um he's got some uh he's got the research on it. But but it's I mean, it's deranged how upside down this is, right? That the more people that the more people who attend church, there is a correlation. Again, not always causation, but there is a correlation between that and increasing number of gun deaths. And you're just like, man, you you would think that would be the reverse. So, no point to this other than Tim. I had to talk about it because I'm sitting there um, seeing this again, going, I don't want to get numb. I don't want to get numb. I don't, don't want to get, get numb, numb and don't want to like, that's four people's lives that are over for no reason. And yep. I don't want to ever not like, well, and the shooter, try to lament, I mean, remember, the 14 year old shooter. Yeah. And just, I mean, yeah. And the parents, I read something briefly that was like, you know, we, there was something, an incident with the kid prior to this and the parents yeah. had those guns and it's just, this, it's just, yeah, I, but yeah. I don't. I don't want to get numb, and I also don't want to let like these people's names and faces just disappear because totally. we're unwilling to have these big conversations or to do to do the hard work to make it end. It's yeah. just unbelievable. That's like three hundred and something this year. I don't even different it's... shootings. I don't even know what the casualty rate is, but no, there's more no. more shootings than there are days in the year. More mass shootings. More, yeah. Yep. So. In the name of Jesus, um, whatever it is that's in the in the air and water in American culture, we just we lament, we lament. Um, so I don't know, especially as we've been going through the stuff on power and um, what it is to be human and the postures of Christian people towards the world uh, that include, you know, vulnerability and meekness and humility um and i get it i mean we we've talked about we've talked about nonviolence, and i mean we we've covered all the ground it's just dadgummit man i just get so i get angry hopeless more angry um despondent that nothing happens um you know and all i know to do is to lament it to um to talk to my kids about it and because you know thankfully a lot of a lot of us are going to die who are these you know 2a like gun worshipers and uh they get a chance to start over or do this right you know what i mean like i don't know and again i understand I, and i know loads of people who have guns got it i understand there is a i, I i'm fine with very sensible like permissions but very restrictive access I, yeah. I get it 
I get it. I just don't, but I don't understand the energy in the Christian, the Christian community, yeah. particularly around this. That's the, that's the thing that's just, it, it's, it's so antithetical um, to the all way of, of Jesus, all of it, all the whole. The well, whole you know, word. I was thinking about yesterday in regards to the name, the accuser, mm. and it's such a specific title mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's so interesting and you think about it in the garden and you can see how there are accusations made that maybe or maybe not pay, played a part in influencing taking that fruit um you can also see jesus temptation in the desert with some accusational kind of things they're like totally. oh you could do this you could be this like and so i think about the way when you said the church thing about those statistics and what that means if, because when you hear the arguments, it's always, it is accusational, right? Like it's people who want to keep their guns are just like, no, these people want to take these away from us. Um, people mm -hmm. want us to be unsafe. Those are all accusations that mm -hmm. pit us against each other. Yeah. And, you know, using language like, like just, uh, tearing down um conservative folks that want to have their weapons for whatever reason the way that the people on the left you just get so degrading in their language which i understand <laughs> in times like this like when mm -hmm. it's human life that's just being disregarded yeah that's infuriating and whatever but you can really see the way these accusational postures yeah just yeah. lengthen, broaden the divide between us as yeah. humans, and then nothing happens. Like we just yeah. don't make progress. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Which is a right, great man. tactic. Makes a lot of sense. Like, well, why the... why be the enemy that fights us when you can be the enemy that divides us and makes us yeah. fight ourselves? Like, yep. <clears throat> yep. It's a much so more it's a smarter this. stance. Yeah. Tim makes a great transitional point. There you go. Because speaking of the I'm accuser, tired of you always having the transitions. I wanted them to be I know, dude, you're, proud of them. That's incredible. So so let's go from one picture of the powers to kind of the origin story of the powers. If you remember last episode, we were talking about the snake. We meet a talking snake, chapter three, verse one. And you're like, oh, it's a talking snake, which, you know, <laughs> oh. seems, yeah, a little, little odd. But then there are hints in the account that, oh, this isn't just your ordinary sort of like snake that we think of, but there are spiritual beings in uh, this heaven and earth space called, you know, the garden. Um, and, and, and that, that the, one of the curses given to this snake is that it will now crawl on its belly. And then you do a bit of background and you realize, oh, in throne room scenes, there are spiritual beings around the throne. Some of them have different names, but at least in, in one particular instance, they're called living creatures. Um, they're called uh, cherub, carobs, as we pronounce it with, you know, the hard K. Um, or as, in, as Isaiah, they're called seraphim or seraph, uh, singular. And um, which is interesting because that's the Hebrew word for venomous snake. Right. And so, you know, you look at ancient Near Eastern throne room depictions, particularly Egyptian, you see flying snakes all over the place. And so the curse that God gives on the serpent, um, you will now go from a position of exaltedness, right? The snake had wisdom of its kind. Um, it was it was more more intelligent and observant than the other. Uh, any of the other beasts in the field, because this was something different. Uh, now it will go to a place of humiliation. You will eat dust and crawl on your belly. And um, and then there will be animosity that's introduced through some sort of childbearing between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And then there's a he, a singular he, that's introduced as 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 one of the seed of the woman of the woman who crushes the serpent's head and the serpent will, will strike back at, at the, uh, the he's heel. And so as we were kind of wrapping up, I want to explore this a little more because this sort of sets up how, um, how the rest of the Bible understands spiritual conflict. Um, that, that the seed here, the word seed, as we talked about, can be singular um, and plural. 
Um, it also can refer to someone's physical descendants, and indeed it does. There, there are very often uh, parts in Genesis or transitions in Genesis where there's a dividing line between two, two brothers or two sets of siblings, or one, one, is, a, a, one is sort of chosen and one is not chosen, or one is godly and the other is not godly. There's just all sorts of conflict between offspring throughout the rest of the book of Genesis and into Exodus. But we also talked about how the, the seed of the serpent is not just a physical descendant, but is rather somebody who images uh, the serpent into the world, who follows in uh, the man and the woman's footsteps in yielding to the serpent's temptation. And, um, and so there, there's this there's this question that's presented in Genesis 3, which is, okay, well, so we're waiting for a he um, to strike against the serpent. And who will that he turn out to be? And Neo. so we're, we're yep, um, exactly, exactly, which is an anagram of one, the one. So, of course, dude. Um, I remember, man, when Matrix came out, how many, like, books – were written about the gospel in the matrix or whatever it was. Totally. Man, if there is an opportunity to make a buck, we will find it. No doubt. And speaking of that, Test thank you minutes. for our Patreon supporters. Um, <laughs> you guys are the best, by the way. Um, so all of that is, all of that is review, which sets us up for a couple of stories that happen later in Genesis. The first one we briefly hit last episode, and it's the story of Cain and Abel. And so what we've got is we've got the, the, the humans, the representative humans now kicked out, ex exiled from the, the land of promise, uh, which is a story Israel's going to redo, you know, in their own way. And they're going to fail in the wilderness and image the snake and then get exiled. I mean, it's like, like this, that the, the, the representative human story is the story of the Bible told over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and so, and, and the serpent has been exiled a, as well. And so we've got now the first glimpse we get of life outside of the heaven and earth space is of a farmer and um, a rancher who both offer sacrifices. So Yahweh is still present. Yahweh is being worshipped. Yahweh is still involved in the, in the human community. Um, one sacrifice is accepted. One's not. There's loads of debate over why. Uh, some think it's it's the the beginning of a motif where the younger gets chosen over the older, and you see that all throughout Genesis as well. Some think it's uh, God's not vegan, and so he's he's more that's a joke. He's more of a carnivore. Um, others think that uh, that Abel was offering the best the best parts of of his sort of crop in terms of the best parts of the animal, whereas Cain just offered. I, and who who knows? The text doesn't say. But but we meet uh, um, we meet the serpent now again in a different form, and so Genesis four verse six the Lord said to Cain, "Why are you angry?" Remember Cain was considering murdering his brother. Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? So this is the choice between following Yahweh's wisdom or Cain defining good and evil for himself. This is the same choice his parents were faced with. But if you do if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you and you must rule over it. Now, good lord, there's so much here. So, <laughs> sin. This is the first time we've met this word and it's introduced in an anthropomorphic kind of way. Sin is crouching yeah. and it desires to have you. The word have there is the, to dominate you, to control you, to master you. It's, it's, um, it's the same word that's used when, um, when Eve is told uh, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Like, oh my goodness, this is such a, it's such a um, kind of a heavy, heavy word. It's desire to control or master. So, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? If you do not do what is right, sin is crouching. So we meet sin. Now, 
the ancient readers would have understood this is what this this is the work of the serpent right here. The serpent is crouching like an animal, but the serpent is called sin, and it desires to master Cain. But notice Cain, the invitation is to rule over the serpent, which was the invitation given to the man and the woman earlier in Genesis. You shall rule over the fish in the sea, the birds of the sky, over the wild animals and all the things that move along the ground. So again, Cain here is given the same opportunity his parents were given to rule over creation instead of being ruled by a part of creation. Do you yeah. see that? Mm -hmm. And you will rule over it. I mean, it's just, oh, like we talked about and marveled at Timothy. Like there's just so many poetic like repetitions of these beats that you see all throughout the text. It's just, it's so brilliant, man. I just get. Churches really have English professors at least like once a quarter. Yes. Teach, like <laughs> hey, and you know what? Poetry you know and what? everything else. Do you know what, Tim? I know an English professor who'd be available for something like that. I know that. a few of those, yeah. So I'm just saying, and Tim has a tweed jacket with uh, corduroy elbow patches. So it's, but I mean, I only I'm just saying. Mike, though. I've never worn it to school. I thought you wore it to school once. Oh, wait. Because that's how I saw you on it. I saw you with it. You what? Is that to a funeral? Oh, just t-shirts? <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> All right. You're tweeting. You want to go to a funeral? Maybe I am. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't you like to know? So you must rule over it. So the picture we have is of now something is loose in God's world that is seeking to rule. And the invitation of the humans is, at least in Cain's instance, is to rule over it. So it's a desire. It's. And again, this is vocational language. They yeah, were image bearers in it's order so interesting to rule. When we've talked, remember the, at the beginning of this series when I asked you like, well, then how do we define rule? Because we only understand it in like a yep. specific way. Now, now you read this and it carries massive obviously, overtones. Yeah, totally. Yep. Which is really yep, interesting. Yep, yep. So, so again, this is image bearing. This is vocational language, yeah. right? They were made in God's image to rule and he's in being invited to rule. And rule in this case means listen to Yahweh if you do what is right, right? As Yahweh defines what is right. Again, it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil all over again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there's this extra element now loose in the world that is called sin. And as we talked about last episode, sin gets personified in, in some of Paul's writing, particularly in Romans. Sin and death are agents in the world that have desires. I mean, it's just, it's mind-blowing, but it starts, it all starts here. We meet a talking snake, then everyone's exiled, and now sin is crouching at the door. All right, so that story is a story of where the, the choice to image the snake or to image Yahweh um, in terms of rule. Um, and notice rule here means listen to Yahweh or, you know, be ruled means don't listen to Yahweh. That's literally right. the choice. <laughs> now, now a, a similar thing happens, but in, 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 in kind of an inverse way in Genesis 6. We hinted at this last episode as well. This is Genesis 6, the very famous or infamous text regarding the Nephilim. Uh, I'll read it and then, but, but we're going to see the same sort of thing here. When human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married or took, is the better translation, any of them that they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. <coughs> Pardon me. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, which is an interesting little tag. When the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were heroes of old men of renown. Now, this is the Genesis 3 story told um, upside down. Because in, in the Genesis 
um, three story, the woman sees that the fruit is pleasing to the eye, good for food. She sees that it's good, good for gaining wisdom. And she takes and she eats all at, and the temptation, all at, uh, it's all at the, the, the like suggestion of a spiritual being who says you can be like Elohim. You can be like God. Elohim is used in Genesis uh, 1 and 3. Yahweh is used in Genesis 2. Um, and Genesis 3, but in, in a little different way. But all that is to say, the temptation is you, you humans can be like one of the sons of God, the sons of Elohim. And, and so the woman saw, she took, she ate. She saw that it was good, she took, yeah. she ate. Here... We have the sons of God. All right. Now, the sons of God, that phrase in the Old Testament is never used of human beings ever. It's eight or nine different times, and it's always used of the host of heaven, the spiritual beings um, that are referenced from Genesis 1 on. All right. So, so this is spiritual beings now trying to be human. All right. So, so you have the human in Genesis three, trying to be like the spiritual beings. Now the spiritual beings are trying to be like the humans. And I have no idea how this works. There are, there are other ancient Near Eastern stories that have similar, like the gods intermarrying with humans. Um, the, that storyline is a pretty popular storyline. There are some scholars who think that, that if, if this is something that actually happened, the reason was the, the, the powers were trying to pollute the bloodline that would produce the he that would crush the snake. Oh. And so what the powers were doing, the, the God, God had said to the, to the serpent, listen, the woman will give birth to a he. And, and you're like, oh, okay, cool. So the powers corrupt childbearing and produce offspring that will image the serpent. Um, so there's some thought, scholarly thought that direction. I have no idea either way what the heck what the heck's going on. But well, if you're just taking the, the text, it's always that the divine beings are always jealous of the humans. That God favors the humans and yes, even and there is some of that. Kind of hints at some of that too in his yes, book. Yes, there is. There as uh, there are absolutely hints, especially when you get into the way the fall of the snake is is used as a way to describe like the fall of the king of Tyre mm -hmm. um, in, I think it's Ezekiel. Um, like some of this, like you were the morning star, you were in Eden. Like some of that language gets recaptured and repurposed around the humiliation of someone who was greatly exalted at one point. Yeah. So we have in Genesis, we, we have the exile of this, this, the, the representative humans and then the spiritual being. Now, the, now we have other spiritual beings who have fallen and who are violating the boundary that God set between the humans and the spiritual beings. So the sons of God, clearly spiritual beings, saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful. Now, this isn't the best translation. The, the word here actually means good. It's copied and pasted from Genesis 3, where the woman saw that the fruit was good. Mm -hmm. So it's literally the same line. The sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were good, and they took any they chose. So the woman, right, sees that it's good and takes. Here, the spiritual beings see that the women are good and they take. Now, God's response to this is, my spirit will not contend with humans forever. Uh, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. Now, I always grew up thinking, well, God just said, no one's going to live beyond 120 years. But if you actually look at the chronology of some of the genealogies in Genesis 5, it's 120 years till the flood. This, ah. this story is why the flood comes. And God starts over with, again, another set of representative humans. All right, we can do the flood story another time, but this, like, this is what is setting up the flood narrative. And, um, and that God's response here is, in 120 years, we're getting rid of the Nephilim. We don't get rid of all the Nephilim, as we'll find out in um, just a little bit. So 
we're asking the question all throughout the Old Testament. The woman is going to give birth to a he who will crush the serpent. That, that he is somebody who will be a, a physical descendant of the woman. Yes, because that's the only kind of, you know, offspring there are physical descendants. But will be somebody who resists the temptation of the serpent. So we meet Cain. Cain does not resist the temptation of the serpent. We find out early humanity does not resist the temptation of the serpent. When, when, we, get to, when we get to the next, um, this next little paragraph, uh, verse 4 of Genesis 6, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. Now, the Nephilim, the word literally means giant, but it also is, is made up of the Hebrew letters that... Um, the same Hebrew letters that that spell like or that mean the fallen ones. Um, uh, so so the reason we call Genesis three the fall is because of this word Nephilim in Genesis six. They're they're called the fallen ones. They've gone from a place of you know exalted status in the heaven and earth space now to the earth space doing you know these just uh, like awful boundary violations. So they're called the Nephilim, the, and the word means giants, but it also is the same letter as the word or phrase "fallen ones," and um, and they're they're men of renown. So the the union of the the sons of God and the daughters of humans produces these kind of mythic giant figures that are called men of renown. Now that phrase is used to describe men who have great prowess in battle. All right. And even though God floods the earth, and we can talk about this later, some of the Nephilim survive. And we meet one of them in Genesis 10. His name is Nimrod, unfortunately. And <laughs> Nimrod is a man of renown who founds the city of Babylon. hey -o. <laughs> So, So think about this. This was written, right? while Israel was in existence and, and subject to all of these foreign powers, and you're getting the origin story of Babylon here, which is uh, the, the, the awful union of the sons of God and daughters of men produced the Nephilim, which caused the flood, but one of them survived. His name was Nimrod, and that's how Babylon started. So this is a, a very Jewish way of subverting the, like, the origin stories of all of the empires around. It's yeah. just, and the violence that accompanies them right now, obviously um, the, the, the human community chooses this place that, that Genesis 11 calls Babel, but it's literally the word is Babylon to build this thing to the sky. So there's a, there's just a lot here, but we haven't met a he and we keep seeing the same temptation. Everybody is, is we, we see we think that it's good, we take, and then, right, we fail, and we image the yeah. serpent into the world. So you literally have the physical descendants of the serpent in the world now, the Nephilim, and the moral descendants of the serpents, um, uh, uh, the moral descendants of the serpent's influence, who are the ones imaging the snake into the world. Are you with me? Yeah. So far, Timothy. Yep. All right, now these threads come together beautifully in the story of David. David comes to us as the, the legit first he. Like, like the, the Old Testament narratives around David present him as the he to end all he's. Like, this is the dude. He is he, man. Um, he is, yep, he is the man after God's own heart. And he fights Goliath. Now, interesting. Goliath is the last of the Nephilim we read about in the Old Testament, right? So that's why they make a big deal of him being a giant. Mm -hmm. And this is so fascinating. Um, the, the, uh, the text makes a big deal about him, his armor, and they give the size and weight of his armor. And it's all in bronze, which fascinatingly is spelled with the same letters as snake. So... <laughs> So Goliath, <laughs> to the ancient reader, has snake all over him. He's, yeah, he is okay. literally an offspring of the snake, and he is the representative of the snake, you know, wow. um, in the world. I mean, unbelievable. And so when David, right, 
again, the inversion of, nope, it's not the powerful one. It's not the first one. It's not the mighty one that gets God's favor. It's the small one, the unchosen one, the unlucky one, right? So when David like cuts the head off of Goliath, I mean, you have, this is the he. You literally have David slaying the snake right there, right there. I mean, and that's why David becomes this model for all of the kings and even David's line, his physical descendants, David's seed, one from your offspring, David, will sit on your throne forever. So you're, you're like, yes, David, this is it. But then you get, you get the Bathsheba story. And if you read it carefully, it says David saw that she was beautiful and he took. Yep. And so he images the serpent. Yep. He succumbs to the serpent's temptation. Right? Yeah. I mean, I get, man, I get freaking goosebumps with this stuff. And, and, and the reason is, it's I like just never when you have one good move in soccer or whatever, and it just keeps working over and over again. So you're just like, well, I'm just gonna keep doing this until they yeah. figure it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The serpent's just yeah. like, well, hey, <laughs> every time. Every time. Uh so so it's absolutely, absolutely fascinating then and the grievousness, because then what happens? Well, what happens is Solomon comes, right? He obviously images the serpent. And then Solomon's offspring split the kingdom. And so, I mean, you just get this, like, it's this, it's the Genesis thing all over again, 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 and again, and again. So when Jesus shows up, um, we're looking for one like David. Um, and so the first thing that happens, we talked about this last episode, and you, you made some great comments about it. The first thing that happens is that Jesus gets taken out to the wilderness, Right? And he's tempted by the Satan himself, the serpent, the whatever. And so here is Jesus, the anti-Adam, the anti-Eve, the anti-Cain, the anti-David, the anti-Moses, the anti-Abraham, where all of the great people of faith who we thought, yes, this is the he, this is the he, all of where all of them failed. Even Israel could have been the he collectively. Yeah. When all of them failed, here's Jesus quoting from Deuteronomy in the wilderness about trusting Yahweh, and Jesus refuses the temptations of the serpent, the first human to have done so his whole life. I mean, it's ridiculous, dude. Ridiculous. And so you're seeing Jesus. So the temptation in the desert literally is, in some ways, the one of the first big ways of breaking that yeah. trend. Yes. So, so uh, Cain was tempted in the wilderness, right? He's outside yeah. of Eden. Israel was tempted in the wilderness and failed, right? So here's Jesus in the wilderness. Yep. And, and, and the temptations were all about tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Worship me and I'll give you all of this. Throw yourself off of here and test God. Turn these stones into bread because you're hungry. And on the surface of it, we're like, okay. But if you channel Jesus's responses back into Deuteronomy and then take those responses back into the actual events that pro that that provoked Moses to teach those lessons to the second generation of Israelites in Deuteronomy that Jesus is quoting from, this is all serpent like he's he's refusing the knowledge of the tree of good and evil for himself. And um, he's the first one that images Yahweh rightly into the world. He's the first yeah. one that rules in the way that Yahweh had intended. He rules over the serpent by refusing the serpent's temptation. That's Which why he so will fascinating say- fascinating because the temptation for every single one of these is a power over move. Yes. Right? Like every single it's, it's one of seeing, them- Well, look, 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 look. It's seeing that it's good and taking. So yeah. you're hungry. Bread would be good. Take bread. <laughs> right. Right? You're you 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 are going, you you are um you're gonna be king. So see that I can give you all of the kingdoms right now. Mm -hmm. See it and take it. I mean, it's literally the same. 
while the same also temptations. like not believing in the promise that Yahweh has brought about provision exactly. or whatever else, saying exactly. so even the power exactly. over of just refusing to trust That's in right. that. That's right. It's just, and then to take us all the way up to today, it's always a power over just struggle wait. And conversation. Just wait, bro. Just you're so smart. You anticipate <laughs> everything. Well, it's just so frustrating to watch friend. the the rhythm that we've yeah. established through history, and then Jesus oh, yeah. breaks the rhythm, and then we just pick it back up again. It's like, yes. But it is fascinating because you don't even. I, it's. I think it's so helpful whether you're talking about ruling, because rule in our lexicon is a power over move. Right. But but this is not. It is mm -hmm. a come in come in line, come under God, uh, image right. what God is doing, and God's not trying to destroy. Your best power over is is powering under God. Yeah. You know and what so I mean? So when you rule over the serpent, it's interesting because it's not like a take up arms <sighs> against and overpower. That's no, just wait. Just wait. Okay. Tim. <laughs> Sorry. Man, you're so good. You're so smart. That blonde head and tweed beer, beard, not beer. Tweed beer. <laughs> so, so this makes sense then of something that Paul writes in Romans, late in Romans 16. He has this weird line. So there, there are factions in uh, the church in Rome. There are different groups within multiple house churches or within a house church who are judging each other on the basis of Jewish identity. Gombus um, thinks these, the, 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 the division here is between Gentiles who are putting on Jewish characteristics, judging Gentiles who don't put on Jewish characteristics and identity markers. Lots of other people think it's uh, Jewish Christians judging non-Jewish Christians, whatever it is. But, Romans isn't just this abstract theological, like, hey, here's my theology of salvation. It is a pastoral letter designed to address a crisis in the church in Rome. Right at the very end, when he's summarizing his argument, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. Such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. They're imaging the serpent, in other words. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, right? That's imaging, that's imaging God. So I rejoice because of you, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Tree of knowledge of good and evil language. And then it says this. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And you're like, what? <laughs> but, but having just done the little journey that we've been on, isn't it interesting that the serpent shows up in how the church relates to each other? Uh -oh. And so at the end of the letter, Paul says, stay away from people who are imaging the serpent in your community. By dividing and misleading and, you know, falsely flattering, these are people who are imaging the snake and God will crush the snake under your feet. In other words, the he that, so the Genesis 3.15, he, the he who will come and crush the snake, in virtue of our being in Christ, we're part of the he now that's crushing the snake. That's what Paul's implication here is. The God of peace will crush the serpent beneath your feet. So this isn't, this isn't a power encounter of demons versus angels and exorcisms. This is a church that's divided. Resist the device of people who are imaging the serpent. You be obedient. People are hearing about it. So keep that up. Stay away from everybody else. And guess what's going to happen when you do that? The serpent will be crushed. And it sounds like it's all accusational. You're not this enough. You're not this enough. You guys are too much of this. Totally. Blah, 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 totally. Self-righteous boasting. Yep. Yeah. But but notice, right? You've just pulled Genesis 3 language all the way into Romans to address a church issue. 
Yeah. And that the church, when it's united around obedience and, and good teaching, crushes, is, in, is, is helping to crush the serpent's head. I mean, it's just so. So that's why in the New Testament, there is so much offspring language about us being children of God. Because offspring, are we the offspring of the seed? Are we the, are the offspring of the serpent or the offspring of the woman and, and, or of Yahweh? And so we get this, the sense in like first John, where this is how we know who the children Yeah, so this is why, Timothy, John Stafford, that you get a bunch of offspring language in the New Testament. Um, so like John 1, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God, which I mean, what a statement that is, right? Or, or first John, this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor does anyone who does not love their brother or sister. So, so everything that's happening in Genesis one through three gets pulled through the entire rest of the Bible. That's our point. Yeah. And again, if to overmake it and to state it one more annoying time, how you begin the story determines what Jesus has come to fix or solve or do. Yeah. And so if you start in Genesis 3 and define sin on the basis of what we think it is, then Jesus has come to solve a sin problem. And certainly that's part of the problem Jesus has come to solve. Sure. But it's so much bigger than that. So, uh, Timothy, uh, for me, um, first of all, you look great. Secondly, for <laughs> me, this, this, this really gives clarity to Paul's language around spiritual warfare. I always thought spiritual warfare is an individualized, I have an angel on one shoulder and a demon on another shoulder. And I'm realizing that is so not what spiritual warfare is about. Uh, what it's about, like when Paul says very famously in Ephesians, do not let the sun go down on your anger. He's not talking to married couples. He's talking to the churches he's writing to. Church, do not let the sun go down on your anger towards each other, or you will give the enemy a foothold. Mm -hmm. So all of these are corporate manifestations of the serpent, right? Divisiveness, slander. Malice, all of the things he names that are social behaviors, that resisting those is how we engage in spiritual warfare. Resisting those is how we image uh, Jesus into the world. And so when we have a church with, what, 40,000 denominations and, you know, clowns like us sitting in, in podcasts, podcast spaces, you know, just kind of tribalizing um it's we're not like the 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 spiritual warfare that it's at issue isn't about um you know whether or not you've you've chosen to overeat or um engage in pornography or overspend or something that certainly matters absolutely and sin is a great word for those words but the kind of spiritual warfare paul is envisioning are the social behaviors of the new humanity mm -hmm. and resisting the social behaviors that image the serpent into the world and putting on the social behaviors. So Paul in, or in Ephesians is so practical. He's like, listen, tell the truth to each other. Put off lying. Hey, for those of you that don't work, go get a job so that you can not be dependent on anybody and support the poor. Like, it's just that practical. When you're tempted to really gossip about that person, don't do it. That's, yeah. that's resisting the serpent, you know? So I, I don't know. It just is totally redefining for me. What are your thoughts? Well, exactly. You said, I think the, so two things, one, like with those seven deadly sins kind of things, like you mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. hinted at, 
all of those are, and we've talked about this a little bit, but those are all dehuman. You just see the theme of what it means to try to like <clears throat> dehumanize as possible as much as possible. And yeah. if division leads ultimately to things like war, right? Like yeah, division as yeah, it trickles yeah. up goes yep. to a point of just absolute human, just killing massive amounts of, of human. And you can see how that foothold, which is such a great word, right? It's like, it's not a, it's not a summiting. It's a giving yeah. them the first good hold to build from, to ascend from. That's right. And, and so you just see how it enables us to, because mm -hmm. those ones you said, gluttony, lust, those things, they strip us of our humanity because they push against what is good for us or what is healthy for us. Yeah. And cause but, divisions. But often those are just defined in individual terms. Totally. But now we see how how it plays into a larger bucket. And that's then right. and then if we give it the language to make it personal and isolating, that's what it yeah. does. It takes yeah. us out of community and isolates us and makes us angry and makes us sad and makes us all these things that are all things that degrade our humanity. So it's like it all yeah. tracks really well, obviously. Yeah. But it's more helpful than the terminology that we were given with. But then the idea of resisting, that's what I kept thinking about the whole time was like with gun violence, with uh, anything that we've talked about on here in the beginning parts, like our job, we have to figure out how to resist, but not resist the way that's easy or the way that we keep mm -hmm. trying mm -hmm. to. We yeah. have to resist. And this is where people like Shane Claiborne are doing heavy lifting is he's he continually is advocating for communal ways around yeah violence or yeah yeah um, degrading yep. language and he's trying to engage these people who keep slamming him on twitter mm -hmm. he just keeps offering his email and his phone number to them being like hey i'd love to chat and they're like no yeah. you're just such a blah 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 and so resisting is such an interesting word because we only we, we kind of know it like rule we only know it in yeah power over I yeah. ideologies so we resist by winning yeah and that's not what this is this is resisting by reminding people what it means to be human together mm -hmm. and, and putting on to... those behaviors that honor exactly yep so it's just i i like inviting people to a resistance i think is mm -hmm. maybe what our job is mm -hmm. but and and we resist yeah go ahead i'm sorry well uh, and then redefining what that means and right exactly offering the tools yes. for that well we resist the way jesus did yeah. He wasn't and passive. sometimes yeah, he wasn't passive, but it's it's gonna take more discernment, more like intentional mm -hmm. effort than just being like, I'm against this for these reasons. Um, you know, so that it shows you it's it's just all so interesting. It shows you where your political engagement, how to do that, and how that's not the be all end all, but it's the vehicle that we have chosen as humans yeah. in this time period. And so we have yeah. to figure out how to do that in a way that promotes human flourishing and promotes right. the least of these. Like I sent you that thing, there's a big thing going on with like, obviously as there always is, but <laughs> uh, trying to strip women of autonomy and even as far as like revoking the 19th amendment and things like mm. that, that ah. so women know their place and, you know, calling women, uh, churches that have women pastors heathens and sure. her her heretics and they're performing heresy by just allowing a woman to teach but these are people who have been women people of color in this country like the, who are the people who have been marginalized mm -hmm. we're seeing a ton of it with um, unhoused people in at least in california like the language mm -hmm. around it has gotten really really violent and so we mm -hmm. who did who does god continue to like how do you do this go take care of these people, mm -hmm, bring them mm -hmm, up, pull mm -hmm. them up. And it's just like, that's the, that is the antithesis to power over. That's it. So it's like learning how to resist and redefine our roles, I think is key that's right. to that's it. imaging Yahweh the best we can and break these rhythms. Like we're just watching, like mm -hmm. we talk about the prison stuff, like breaking was like the hurt people, hurt people, but healed mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. can heal people breaking cycles. And yeah. you just illustrated the history of humanity is <clears throat> this one particular cycle that we just cannot All right. get out of. And yeah. then Jesus is like, well, let me show you how to do it. 
This is yeah. how you resist. This is how you break that cycle. And his resistance was, like you said, not passive, but also that was full a, of creative a route goodness. of nonviolence and yeah, and yeah, and power under to violence. Yeah, it's just it all yeah. makes a lot of sense, but it takes right. a lot of work on our well, part. And the, and the and the issue is we're so twisted that that there 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 are dear brothers and sisters who see any talk this way as liberal. Like exactly, this is some sort of social perversion of the gospel or whatever. And you're like, wow, I don't, I just don't see it that way. I just, I, well, I would, the I article think... that I sent you about the crusades where people were debating Christian yeah, violence yeah, yeah. online and, and talking yeah. about how the Christians, they weren't that bad because Christians were being persecuted. So we did, we persecuted bigger, I, but it was, it was self-preservation. Tim, it was defense. Tim, Tim, but it's interesting because that I rhetoric love, is really big I love, right now. I love that you said the other night, you said, or no, it was last night. <laughs> don't worry, you I just said, left therapy. You said, uh, good night. Don't worry, I just left therapy. As you shared, because our mutual <laughs> friend and I share a concern for Tim's mental health around some of the rabbit holes. Because I think, I think you said this week we were debating whether Winston Churchill was the bad guy of World War II. And then we were debating the 19th Amendment. And then we were debating, what was the other thing that you just literally just mentioned? The Crusades. The Crusades. So violence, Christian, the okay of Christian violence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's like, I, I, I just think these people are in it for clicks. I mean, I, I just don't. They are, but I, they I do influence a large swath of yeah. quote unquote Christians. And then that rhetoric gets. Yeah. I mean, you watch, yeah. it, it, it leads to what you just said at the beginning about that where there's more people in church, there's more mm -hmm, whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's like, there are, there are daisy chains that lead to these kind of things. And if Ooh, we good, can't change the conversation, metaphor. then yeah, it's going to continue to happen. And the only reason that I always bring it up, and I've said this a thousand times is because humans are losing their lives. Like it's not mm -hmm, just a, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's not just a rhetorical debate. Yeah. There, there are casualties to these arguments and yeah. I don't want to watch more kids die. And I don't think anybody does, but we have to resist in a way that changes the changes the narrative. Yeah. Well said, dude. Somehow. Look at you, Look at you go. Look well, timestamp Tim's thoughts. Tim's profound thoughts right at the very end. Just timestamp that. Ten minutes left. Tim's profound thoughts. Otherwise, friends, we will keep pushing on. Um, we got a, a couple of very nice emails complimenting us in our thousand part series. And so <laughs> for those of you that, that enjoy those, thank you. Um, thanks for sticking it out. Um, otherwise I think we're, we're all, we're all good. Timothy it's Thursday. You've got, you've got vacation plans, um, for the weekend. Tomorrow. So we had to record. Yeah. We had to record early. Yours truly. I'm going to work on a sermon for this week we've been we've been doing sermon series named after southern california punk bands which i love which yeah which has been we did bad religion and then we did social distortion now we're doing um a politics series called the misfits and then we're doing um an ephesian series called the offspring so it'll be there great you have it yeah <laughs> susie had a, a good idea to do a, a like a generosity series called pennywise and um you do a sexuality series on the Sex Pistols. Um, I mean, it all, it's just all kind of right there. Just keeps so, going. Yeah. Human violence with the clash. Yeah. Oh, the clash. <laughs> yes. Anyway, we love you all. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in, and we'll see you next episode.